Come on, church. This is all about Jesus this morning. Right now is when we give back to God. We give with our praise and worship. Then we give with our, our offerings. Come on, let's offer up to God our praise first. Come on. Has God been good to you? Has Jesus been good to you, church? Look at yourselves this morning. You're clothed and you're in your right mind. God has been good to you. Come on, let's not hold back praise to Jesus. Uh, he's worthy. He just gave his life for you and I. Oh, he's worthy, but he's done so much more than just die for us. Come on, don't hold back anymore, church. Let a praise break through. Let it break through all the lies of the devil, all the condemnation of hell, saying you're unworthy, you're unworthy. Jesus says you are worthy. That's why I gave my son. That's why I died for you. Because I see the worth in you, my child. God sees your worth. You say, but I've fallen so many times, God said, but you've gotten back up. And here you are this morning. I love you, my son. I love you, my daughter. Come on, lift your hands to the God that loves you. Surrender. I surrender Oh, dear. 
in your presence. That's where I belong in your presence. That's where I'm made strong. There's nothing worth more that will ever come close. No. You're our living hope. Your presence, Lord. There's nothing worth more. There's nothing worth more that could ever.
Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Wonderful Jesus. Yes, give him praise. Hallelujah. Wonderful Jesus. Glory to God. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Oh. We serve a good God. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Thank you. Well, I'd like to say good morning on behalf of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And happy Mother's Day to all the wonderful mothers that are in the congregation and those who aren't here today. Amen? Amen. A mother is a good thing. Yes. Fathers are okay. <laughs> but there's nobody like your mom. Yes. There can be differences. There can be struggles. They can put you out of the house. <laughs> they can bring you back in. Yes. But the great and wonderful thing is, we only get one. Yes. And if there's a difference between you and your mom today, I'm going to share. Please reach out to them and tell them that you do truly love them. Yes. Because we do only get one. Amen? Amen? We're going to take a look at Proverbs chapter 31, verse 25. And, and this kind of shares a little bit about, about women and um, how a godly woman is. So we're going to start at verse 25, Proverbs 31. It says, strength and dignity are her clothing, and she smiles at the future. She opens her mouth in wisdom and the teachings of kindness is on her tongue. Amen? She looks well to the ways of her household and does not eat of the bread of idleness. Mm. Her children rise up and bless her, her husband also, and he praises her, saying, Many daughters have done nobly, but you exceed them all. Charm is deceitful, Got to watch that. And beauty is vain. But a woman who fears the Lord, she shall be praised. Amen? Amen? 
And that's what we do. We're going to praise our moms this morning. We're going to praise our wives this morning. Amen. Because we, we serve a wonderful God, a God who loves us and who cares for us. And he wants us to be able to know how much he does love us, how much he cares for us. Because he put mothers in a place like that scripture says. Because without moms, I don't know where you would be, but I definitely, I probably would not be here. So take time to love on your mom, love on your wife, and let's lift them up in prayer and lift up maybe some neighbors of ours who we don't know, um, who, who we know, or some we don't know who don't know Jesus. Amen? Because God wants to bless them too. He wants to bring them into the kingdom. Father, we want to take this time to thank you, O oh God. We lift you up this morning, Lord. We pray for the pastor and his wife, Lord God. We pray, Lord God, for the, the uh, baby church, Lord God, for Pastor Warren and his wife, Lord. Father, we lift them up to you this morning, O oh God. And Father, we ask that your Holy Spirit's power and anointing, Lord God, would go before them, God. The congregation, Lord God, would be ready, Lord, to hear the word of the Lord today. Father, that you would speak to us, oh God, that you would teach us, Lord God, how we are to behave, how we are to be instructed, Lord, how we are to walk in this newness of life that you have given to us, oh God. Father, we ask that you would bless the mothers, Lord, in this congregation, Lord God, that, Father, that God, know, that you have placed them in a place of authority to raise up children in the house of God. Father, in how to, how to behave. Father, we ask, oh God, that as you move this morning, Lord God, you would visit those who are sick, those who are afflicted, Lord God. And Father, that your spirit, Lord God, would be poured out upon them, oh God. Father, we pray for the drug addict, Lord, this morning, oh God. We pray, oh God, for deliverance, Lord. We pray, God, that the drugs that they use would not get them high. That, God, that they would take time this morning to think about a holy God. Father, we ask, Lord, that your spirit would move and flow in and out of hospitals this morning. God, that you would move on the hearts of those, Lord, who don't know you today. God, that they would hear that knocking on the heart and invite you in today. Father, we thank you and we praise you, Lord God. We ask that you would bless this Mother's Day. In Jesus Christ's name, amen. Amen. Please greet one another, especially greet the women, and say happy Mother's Day to them. Amen.
pass around the microphone, everybody would have a mother story. Amen. But I got a good one. You know, my mom passed away some years ago. But you know, she had Alzheimer's right before she died. And it was so tragic. Matter of fact, I'm writing a message about remembering. And I'm going to talk in this message about what I'm going to say to you right now, how my mother forgot me at the end of her life. Alzheimer's is a wicked thing because once it erases memory, it erases pretty much your life. Because how I many know life really is memory? Yeah. And I remember going to see her, and my sister said to her, Mom, this is Marty. And she says, Who? And I said, Mom, it's me. Your baby boy. She would always call me her baby boy because I'm the youngest son. And she said, who? And she said, Mom, is, don't you know him? And she couldn't remember me. And the feeling that I had was so sad because every time I would go and see my mom, we would laugh and have a cup of tea. And we would talk about this one story when I used to be in high school. I used to wrestle on the team and she came to one of the matches and the guy slammed my head down on the mat so hard that it knocked me out and I blacked out and so they took me in the back now my mom and my sister tell me the story because I was out I don't remember the details and they took me back in the little medical room and they were trying to get me to wake up and I guess it happens a lot during wrestling so they pulled out this stuff called the smelling salts and they're trying to put it on. And I was so knocked out that even the smelling salts didn't work. And it didn't bring me back. And about that time, my mom comes bursting into the medical room. And they said, ma'am, you can't come in here. Ma'am, you can't come in here. She said, y'all better get out of here before somebody get hurt. <laughs> she said, I'm his mother. And she didn't wait for permission. She pushed everybody out of the way. She got down on that little bench where I was, and she picked my head up, and she did what the doctor and the smelling salts couldn't do. She got me to open my eyes. Mm. Amen. And I remember the coach in the practice the very next week, he said, I don't know what magic your mama has. <laughs> he said, but we were shaking you. We were smacking you. We were giving you smelling salts. You wouldn't wake up. He said, but as soon as your mama took you up in her arms, he said, she started talking to you. He said, you open your eyes. I said, because that's my mama. Yep. Mm -hmm. Hey, that's called mama magic. Yeah. Hallelujah. And me and my mom would laugh about that every time we would get together because I would talk about, I said, do a little bit of that mama magic. And we would talk about it when she would cook. I said, that's that mama magic. Every time she would do something, me and her had this great, great laugh about how mothers have this magic that no one else has. And anybody here who has a mother, you know exactly what I'm talking about. Mama magic. Mamas can make money stretch more than an accountant can. Amen. Ain't it the truth? 
Mamas can have patience more than doctors can. Mama can come up with things that politicians can't come up with. Mamas can work magic. They can make something out of nothing. Yeah. Woo! My mama can take chicken neck and she can make a meal that's better than a steakhouse. Mm. Come on, that's called mama magic. Y'all know what I'm talking about. You give her some kidneys, some liver, and some, and, 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 and some chicken feet and stuff like that. Oh, my goodness. And so we celebrate mothers not just because, like Brother Reggie said, you only get one, but because mothers, when nobody else cared, mothers cared. Yeah. Come on, when everybody else gave up, mothers never give up. And I am so grateful to my mom and my grandmother and every lady in here who is a mother. We so appreciate you because it's so true what Brother Reggie said. Without a mother's love and a mother care, none of us would make it here today. Amen. Nobody would be here. Let's give a hand to all the mothers. Come on. <laughs> all right. So in a little while, we got a little gift bag that we're going to give out to the mothers because we so appreciate them. But what I want us to do right now is I want us to take our offering. I want our ushers to come so that we can give toward the work of the Lord. And the big, big word today that was really on my heart about our offering is all about this word worth. I was with the real estate guy about a month ago. He's the guy who sold us the house that I'm living in. And we were going around looking at some houses with him, you know, about a month ago. And it's so funny because the house that he showed us, he gave us the price. And I said, man, that house ain't worth that. And he says, you know, Marty, he said, it's easy for you to say that. He said, but somebody's going to buy this house for that price. I said, but look at the carpet. Look at the windows. Look at the caulking. I said, look at the cracks and this and look at the that. And I was pointing out. He said, yeah, but somebody will see what you don't see. And what he started telling me, he said, the reason I'm in business as a realtor is not because of folks like you <laughs> who come in and see every flaw. He said, but it's people who are coming to this house, they'll see what you can't see and they'll say it's worth it to them. He said, what drives the real estate market? He said, is somebody considers it worth their money. Now, as he was explaining that to me, I couldn't help but to think about giving to God. Because one thing I can tell you now is I've learned over my Christian life that God is worth it. Come on, can you say amen? amen. Now, you know, for some people, they'll come to church or they'll give their life to Jesus. And they'll complain any time an offering is taken. They'll say, you know what, nah, the church wants my money, the pastor wants my money. They'll say the organization wants my money. And you know, I used to be like that. I would take my little $5 and drop it in, and I was so happy and so satisfied. But it's not because God was only worth $5, because you know he's worth a lot more. But see, I fell in love with him when I learned what forgiveness was. When I learned what grace was and what mercy was. When I learned about what hellfire was. When I learned about eternity and, and forever. And I learned about the death of Jesus and the suffering that an innocent took for a guilty like me. And the more I listened to the word and studied it, the more I understood, you know, five dollars is nothing for a savior. Come on, everybody. And I understood what the Bible said about tithing and offerings and giving and pledges. And, and giving became a joy when my heart changed. I'm going to tell you something. When I think, folks, about what that man in that real estate office was saying to me about worth, people will say, you know what? I don't care what nobody else has said about this house. Me and my family want it. And the value is not determined by a market. The value is determined by who's willing to pay. He said, if a house sits here for years, nobody says it's worth it. He said, but you see these places, they're going to go because somebody's going to come along and they're going to see in this place nobody else sees 
And I'm going to tell you, folks, the world out there, we just say the name of Jesus, they don't see anything. Come on, you know it's the truth. But see, that's because they haven't experienced his grace. And they haven't learned the beauty of what salvation is and what God did for us. And for us that are here today, how many of you are saved? And you're glad that you're saved. Thank God. So you know that when it comes time to take an offering, our feeling is, I wish I could give more. To me, I always feel like I wish I could write a bigger check. I wish I could do so much more. Why? Because what God did for me, I just pray that he'll do for somebody else. And one day, folks, when Jesus comes again, the Bible says that the joy that we're going to feel knowing that everything we've sacrificed is worth it and everything we thought on this earth was worthy, we're going to leave it all behind. And the only thing that's going to matter then is, God, I thank you for coming and giving your life for me. And I'm so glad that I could do a part in your kingdom. So let's give knowing that Jesus is worth it all today. Come on, let's bless his kingdom. Let's bless his house. Let's reach down and continue to give. Remember, uh, our deadline is coming up this week for collecting the money. We've got to get those tickets for those pastors in Jamaica. So if you can help us, remember that as well. So let's bow our heads and let's pray. I'm going to ask Brother Glenn if he would just lift his voice. And thank God for our being able to give and ask blessing for those that give today. Everybody, let's bless the Lord. We appreciate you today. Come on. Come on, everybody. Magnify Jesus. Magnify Jesus. Yeah, yeah. Magnify the Lord. Let's give the Lord a hand clap and just, just thank him today for the service and all of our mothers. Come on, put your hands together like that. Amen. Appreciate that. You know, I am so grateful today for Brother Danny, Stephanie, Brother Will, and all of our worship team. You know, I'm just standing over here worshiping God, and I'm just being so caught up in the presence of God that you just feel the favor of the Lord. Listen, I thank God that we can worship him. And I thank God for such a great team of people who work so hard so that we can have a great worship service. And I am so grateful. Folks, that's some hard work. But I tell you, I feel God here today. Amen and amen. Now, right after the service, uh, we're having a short meet and greet. 
you know, we always do this once a month, you know, where we just gather together down in the fellowship hall. Uh, the ladies have prepared some snacks. It's our time to sit down and just take five minutes and chat with someone. You know, life is so fast in the big city, you know, people just moving all the time, moving all the time. But church is also a place of fellowship. Come on. Come on, folks. I mean, where well, you meet friends and you spend time and you share phone numbers and call each other during the week and encourage them in the faith. You know, when somebody's down, you pick them up. Hallelujah. And so that's what we spend a few moments for, just sharing our hearts, sharing our lives together. Because I'll tell you something, as much as I love all of my immediate family, there's a lot of people in my immediate family who aren't going to make it to heaven. I sure don't rejoice in it. I share the gospel with them. I pray with them. I want them all to be saved. But I'll tell you what, your church family is your family. Where you come and you fellowship together and you enjoy God's presence. And so let's strengthen each other. Something might be said that will hold you, that will help you throughout this week. So spend a few moments with us after the service for the meet and greet. So immediately downstairs right after the service, you don't have to just dash out right away, please. Remember all of the church services? Service tonight is our second service at 630. And then open the building for prayer every Tuesday night. We just open up the church and we just come and pray. And then on Wednesday is Bible study and we outreach on Friday. So every week we keep the same schedule, just continue to pray, asking God to lead us, and then we share the gospel one with another. So if you can join us for those services, please come back and you will be blessed. Amen. <laughs> Hey, summertime is coming, so we're getting ready for the boot camp. Uh, Brother Danny so graciously every year organizes the boot camp for any teenagers. What's the ages? 13 to 18. If you have a 13 to 18-year-old and you'd like them to go to a spiritual boot camp, they do this in the month of July up in the state of North Carolina. Our Brother Danny usually drives them up on Monday and picks everybody up on Friday. It's one week. And so it's a nice boot camp where they, 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 they take away everybody's cell phone. Listen, if, if, if it's just for that alone, it's worth it. Just to see somebody from 13 to 18 without their head down in a cell phone, that's a glorious thing. So take your phone away for a week and make kids talk to each other and listen to the word of God. They do activities. They have chapel. It's a, uh, you come back always with great testimonies of things God has done in these teenagers' lives. Many of them give their life to Christ during the boot camp. It's a beautiful time. So if you would like your kid to go, uh, please let Brother Danny know. He'll give you the application, give you all the information. Uh, just make sure that you start early. Don't wait late every year. People wait to the last minute. We, when they get filled up, we can't get anybody else in. So let's start now. If you want your kid to go, See, Brother Danny, he'll give you all the information and he'll give you the slips and everything that you need for that. Remember, tomorrow, Monday, we're flying out to the nation of Belize. Amen. This is our missionary trip to the nation of Belize. Some of you, I asked you to do your geography because some people are saying, Pastor, where is Belize? My Lord. So listen, get your map out. Come on. Do a little bit of homework and look at where the nation of Belize is. It's just between Mexico and Central America, right on the Gulf, Gulf Coast. It's a short flight, about three hours to fly there. And it's, it's worlds away from Atlanta, Georgia. And we have a number of churches there and a baby church there. And we're going to go there and minister on the ground, do some outreaching, do some preaching. And so it's going to be a great missions trip. And so pray for us. Uh, we're going to be flying out tomorrow. And it's going to be Monday to Thursday and flying back on Friday. So next Sunday we'll be able to stand up and give you another good report. Listen, every time we do a missions trip, if you can't go, your prayers can go with us. So just pray. Say, oh God, give us a safe journey over and back. And many of these third world countries, there's all kind of dangers and people trying to rip you off and all kind of stuff. People are just desperate. But I'll tell you what, we have some churches there that are doing a great, great job reaching out and we're going to go and give them a little boost and preach and minister, take some pictures and come back and let you know all that God has done. So you be a blessing in that and pray for us. Amen. All right. God is good all the time. All right. Now listen, before we look into the scripture today, uh, the ushers are going to pass out these bags for our mothers. And so uh, I think they got something in the back. Ron, make sure they, 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 they bring it out because uh, they had some little 
of Mother's Day gift bags. And if you're a mother, do like this. I even told Tabitha, I said, Tabitha, you're a mother now. Hallelujah. Soon to be. I said, so you get to get a bag this year. Praise God. Hallelujah. So listen, I want the ushers to pass those out. Come on, make sure every mother in the building gets their goodie bag from MACC. Come on, folks. Now listen, ain't no gold in there now. And I saw some of y'all getting excited like, woo, listen. <laughs> what it means is we love you, we appreciate you, we recognize your great sacrifice as a mother, and we recognize that God has blessed you, and you could be able to have children that could be seeds unto God, and so we really thank God for every mother. Come on, make sure every mother gets one. Now, when I say mothers, I'm talking real mothers now. Come on. I know everything has been redefined in our generation. Come on, so we, ain't, we, we, we don't want to go there right now, but I want every mother to make sure they get one. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Everybody good? Tabitha, you got yours? Amen. <laughs> Hallelujah. We thank God for his goodness. Hallelujah. Well, one more time, everybody, let's give the mothers a hand. Come on, Mother's Day today. <laughs> Hallelujah. Now, our scripture reading this morning is going to come out of the Bible in the book of Genesis. I want you to get your scripture, and I want you to look with me at the book of Genesis, chapter number 29, and I'm going to read verse 32 down to verse 35. Come on, this is the Old Testament, the book of Genesis, chapter number 29, everybody. And let's just read these short verses, 32 down to verse 35. Hallelujah. Well, they said it was going to storm all day, but we had a little shower this morning, but right now it looks like we're going to have a pretty good day. Amen. God is good. Genesis chapter 29. Starting in verse number 32. If you're ready, say praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. All right. Follow it closely. Remember, if you don't have a Bible, the scripture is posted on the screen right behind me. You can just read it there and follow with us. Genesis 29, verse number 32 down to verse 35. Okay, here's what the Bible says. It says, when the Lord saw that Leah was unloved, he opened her womb, but Rachel was barren. So Leah conceived and bore a son, and she called his name Reuben. For she said, the Lord has surely looked on my affliction. Now, therefore, my husband will love me. Then she conceived again and bore a son. And she said, because the Lord has heard that I am unloved, he has therefore given me this son also. And she called his name Simeon. She conceived again and bore a son and said, Now, this time my husband will become attached to me because I have borne him three sons. Therefore, his name was called Levi. Verse 35 says, And she conceived again and bore a son and said, Now I will praise the Lord Therefore, she called his name what? Judah. And Pastor Neil told us last week that Judah means praise. She called his name Judah. Then she stopped bearing. I want you all to look up here at me today because I get mad at the devil for a lot of things. I'll tell you one of the things that I really get mad at the devil for, and that is what he does 
to women, wives, and mothers. You know, sometimes if I'm driving down the street, this just happened to me on Friday night when we were going downtown. I was driving down Cortland Avenue and I saw a bunch of girls on their way, what seemed to me they were going to a club. And they were dressed in what looked like fishnet material, which is see through. And so their undergarments were the only thing covering them. And on the outside, they had these fishnets. And you might as well have took it off because everything was showing. And as they were walking down the street, cars were driving by, guys were yelling and screaming, they were blowing the horn, all kind of what they call cat calls, and guys were saying abusive and ungodly things. And you know, they were giggling and giggling as if this was funny. And I'm just saying to myself, it is so disgusting what Satan has done to women today. And so I figured that this morning I would take a few moments so that we could take a shot at the enemy, encourage women, and let them know that there is hope in the Lord Jesus Christ. Can you all say amen to that? Now this inspired me for my entire message. I have a news article, and it's probably about eight or nine months old, somewhere around the summer of last year, I picked up this news article and I saved it, knowing that one day I would preach something about this. And in the news article, the question at the headline was this. Please listen closely, everybody. It said, what is happening to women, wives, and mothers? why I call my message this morning hope for women wives and mothers so the article asked the question what is happening to women to wives and to mothers and then it starts talking about how women are prescribed antidepressant medicine at almost a 65 percent increase rate every year in other words 2019, 65% more women are going on antidepressants than last year. Last year, 65% more than 2017. Do you get what I'm saying? What they're saying is women are coming in, getting on antidepressants, he said, and the rate continues to climb year after year after year after year. And then it showed the statistic for men. And men's rate is increasing about 5%, but women is increasing about 65%. And so the question is, what is happening to women and to mothers and to wives? Why do they go into doctor's offices, not for medical problems, but for stress and anxiety problems, and for coping medicine just so they can get through the day and to get through the week. Now, these are not Christian people. These are not Bible theological students or anything like that. These are just people in the world just trying to come to grips. Something is happening to our women, and what I described to you on Cortland Avenue is proof of it. Sometimes this nightclub right here people will start lining up when we have evening service sometimes and if you'll just look at the women in the line you would almost swear that it's a sideshow the way they are speaking the way they are dressing the way they are behaving and you're going you know whatever happened to women you know being women of virtue where a man could open the door for them and say excuse me ma'am and I said you know something really has changed so the article really has something to say let me throw you out some information that will help you understand why this means so much to me this morning they said the HIV rate the new diagnosis is more in women than in men HIV. Now most of you know that back in 1981, HIV was discovered 
to be rampant inside the male homosexual community. And matter of fact, they didn't call it AIDS back then. They call it gay-related immune deficiency syndrome. In other words, it was happening inside the male gay population. But all of a sudden, the new cases have skyrocketed among women. What's happening to women? It said that women now are filing equal amount of divorce petitions as men. It used to be that nasty old men would just see a younger girl and divorce their wife and leave their family. It said, but now it is women who are giving up and they're filing for divorce at an equal rate to men. It said, this used to be a man's problem, leaving their children, leaving their family, just walking away. He said, now women are doing it. And so the article keeps asking, what's happening to women? Y'all getting quiet. I can tell some of you are a little bit either interested or upset. But just keep listening to me. It says here that when it comes to these antidepressants, it said the greatest increase in women comes in teenage girls. Listen to this. Teenage girls, mothers of children, and women over the age of 50. Now just process it for a minute. Teenage girls are saying, I can't cope. Listen, teenage girls ought to be in the most joyful time of their life. You know, they're just finishing high school, you know, just getting ready to go into the workforce, got everything to look forward to, but instead of that, hanging out with their friends and having slumber parties and pillow fights. They're going in and getting antidepressants. They feel like they want to take their own life. They cannot cope. Here is the question. What is happening to our women? The other group that they notice an increase in is mothers. They said mothers are changing. Mothers used to lay down their life. Mothers used to sacrifice. Mothers used to give up everything. If I got to stay home to take care of my kids, that's fine. Whatever I got to do. If I can't eat, my children will eat. Do you all remember when mothers used to be like that? Say, but what's happening now is mothers can't cope. They're shaking their children to death. They're leaving their children at the hospital. Some women are, are taking kids to the dumpster. Some kids are leaving them on the doorstep of other relatives. In other words, what was basic to a woman has now become a crisis. I've got a child. I can't shut him up. I can't take it. I can't go with my friends. I can't do this. I can't work. And it's like something is happening. And women, i got to cope. And mothers are getting on medication. Why? All they did was have a child. The last group says is women over the age of 50. When I look at that, I'll tell you what really, really moves me. It said these women in the article, women who reach the age of 50, we call it half of a century. And they look back over their life and they say, how did I get here? And in the article, it said a lot of these women have fooled around with married men. And all of a sudden, they realize he's not leaving his wife. And I've put off getting married and meeting my own partner, fooling around with this married man. And now I feel like my years have become too late, and they go into depression. You ought to leave married men alone. The other reason they were saying that women over 50 is because in their 20s, they listen to the lie of the feminist movement that you've got to compete with, women, with men. Listen, women are not made to compete with men. Men are men and women are women. But I'm going to go and compete and, and, and I'm going to get in the workforce and I'm gonna, then all of a sudden they get to be about 50 years old and they look back and, and realize that, yeah, I got all this money. Yes, look, I got this. I've competed with I got a house too and, and I've got a car and, and I've got a PhD and I've got all that. But you see, then they realize the thing that they desperately want the most. I gave it up in pursuit 
of riches and wealth. Now they can't turn back the years. I'm going to tell you something, folks. We are in a church today, and the Bible has something to say to women, wives, and mothers. The amens are very, very quiet. Well, you all should have known that as we come on Mother's Day that I'm going to say something to expose the devil. But as we expose and crush the devil, we dignify and lift up women, wives, and mothers. And we bring them back to the truth of what the scripture taught about God creating man and women. And if you hear what God would say to you this morning, you can save your future, you can save your daughters, you can save your granddaughters by number one, grabbing them by the hand and bringing them to church. I call it hope for women, wives, and mothers. Now, I want to read a scripture to you, everybody, before we talk about Leah in Genesis 29. The scripture is 1 Corinthians chapter 11. So let's go there real quickly. Genesis, I mean, um, 1 Corinthians chapter 11. And let me read to you what the Bible says. I'm going to read verse 8 down to verse 12. Please, I want every woman, every wife, every mother, every young girl, if you're a teenager, it doesn't matter. Just Give me these next few moments so that the word of God can bless us today. All right, I want you to look up here on the screen and let me read to you 1 Corinthians 11. I'm going to read verse 8 down to verse 12. Please look at the Bible. Here's what it says. It says, for man is not from woman, but woman from man. I can probably feel somebody getting triggered right now. Nor was man created for the woman, but woman for the man. Calm down, calm down, calm down, calm down, calm down. Take it easy now, come on. <laughs> it says, for this reason, the woman ought to have a symbol of authority on her head because of the angels. This word angels is the Greek word principalities, which means spiritual beings. It's not necessarily talking about angels that come to bless you and protect you. It's talking about principalities, evil, demonic powers that want to harm you. Now continue reading and then I'm going to come back and talk about it. It says, nevertheless, neither is man independent of woman, nor woman independent of man in the Lord. For as woman came from man, even so man also comes through woman. Y'all ladies ought to be, come on, we're getting back where we need to be now. Y'all say amen. amen. Said we couldn't exist without you. Remember James Brown said, it's a man's world. Y'all remember that? <laughs> it's a man's world. But it wouldn't be nothing without a woman or a girl. Go ahead, James. Go ahead. <laughs> For as woman came from man, even so man also comes through woman. But all things are from God. Now, here are the lessons that this one passage wants us to leave here with today. Listen very closely. Number one, it says a woman came from a man. She was taken out of a man's side. Say amen. amen. That's number one. Number two, it says that a woman was made for a man. God made a man, said it's not good for him to be alone, and he made a woman for a man. Amen. Number three, it says a woman ought to have a symbol on her head because of principalities. In other words, there are demonic powers that are attracted and are specifically dispatched to harm women. That's why in the Garden of Eden, the devil came to attack the woman. And it said, because of this, it says a woman ought to have a symbol on her head that you know what? I am under a man's protection 
So you're not coming here to trouble me. If you're going to harm me, you're going to have to come through the man who God has sent in my life to protect me. In other words, he said, women don't stand alone. He said, because these attacks are going to come after them, there is a symbol on their head that lets evil principalities know that, you know what, she is covered, she is protected. I am thanking God for this. Here's another lesson. It says that in Christ, men and women need each other. You're not going to hear that in the universities today. What you're going to hear is, I don't need no man. Well, I'm sure glad that you ain't God, because God says that you do. And then it says, finally, that in Christ, everything changes when Christ comes into your life. Because all of the difficulty and the, what we call sexism and discrimination and male chauvinism and, and, and female rebellion, he said all of those things, that when it comes to Jesus Christ, God changes it all. Why? Because when Jesus is Lord, you don't have to express your hurt and your anger toward women or your hurt and your anger toward men. You come to Jesus and God gives us a better way. Now today, folks, I read that scripture because I simply want you to know that in walking with Jesus and in obeying God, men and women can work this thing out. Hallelujah today. Now, me and my wife have been married for 37 years. Now, let me tell you all something. Listen, we are so different. And if it wasn't for Jesus, I mean, that woman had wanted to strangle me so many times. And I've so many nights want to get up and jump in my car and just fly down the freeway. But I'll tell you why we're still married today and our children are still happy and our grandchildren are happy. Not because of me and her but because of Jesus in our life. Amen. Amen. God gives us a much better way than to vent our anger with one another. He tells us in the scripture how to love each other, how to forgive each other, how to get on, how to deal with you, how to talk things through, and how to pray. Thank you, Jesus. So I'm here to tell you that because we're in a Christian church, we have hope today. And the devastating statistics that are in this article that I read, they don't have to be your lot in life, and they don't have to be your future. Come on, because in Jesus, all things are different. Now look at me up here, everybody. Come on, come on. Don't look at your phone for a minute. Come on, come on. Get your head out of your nose. Look at me, everybody. God created man and woman. And God has determined that a woman be covered by a man. God said that. He said the symbol on her head, and if you read the context in 1 Corinthians 11, it says a woman's hair is given to her as a covering, and it says nature said it is a shame for a man to have long hair. He said because this is a symbol that God has given. He said so that the principalities can understand this is what we call a covered woman. And that means that emotionally and spiritually, when she feels like I'm losing it, there is a man there to cover her and say, devil, you're not going to send her crazy. You're not going to harm the mother of my children. You're not going to harm the object of my love. You're not going to harm this woman that I've made a covenant with and put a ring on her finger. You're not going to do this to her. And it is a man's dominion and authority that is to beat back the powers of hell. God determined that a man would cover a woman emotionally and spiritually. And if you're a man here and you ain't doing your job, you need to step up to the plate. God has determined that a man protect a woman physically. In other words, I'll take a bullet for you. I'll jump in front of the bus for you. 
If a thief comes in, don't sell your wife. You better go down there and see what's going on. No, you put your wife in a safe place and you go down there and confront the thief. What's wrong with y'all, brother? Anyway, let me keep on going. God has determined that a man cover a woman emotionally and spiritually, that a man protect a woman physically, and that a man provide for a woman materially. Boy, Marlene is with me. Amen. Hey, I like that. <laughs> now, we, know we live in an age of two-income households, and I'm so grateful that a lot of women work and they make it happen, you know, and they help out. But I'm going to tell you something, folks. If somebody is not going to work, it ought not to be the man. I'm just telling y'all how it is. I said if somebody got to stay home, it ought not to be the man staying home. Now, we, we can go into that a little deeper at another time. But I can't mess with that right now. But I at least need y'all sisters. This is Mother's Day. Y'all say amen. amen. <laughs> you know, in the article, it says that one of the biggest factors, you know, in a woman's success is her father and her husband. Some of you might have seen the little thing that I posted this past week about the woman who owes all of her success not to feminism, not to lesbianism, or not to anything like that. She owes all of her success as a wife, a woman, as a mother, she says, to her father and her husband. She is right in line with what we read in 1 Corinthians 11. What she is saying is, I am safe I am secured, I am healthy, I am joyful, not because I went out there and tried to make a way for myself, but because I had a father who protected and covered me, and he walked down the aisle and gave me to a man who is now my husband, who has taken over the job of providing and protecting me. You'll have to do a Bible sometimes as to why in the New Testament God is so adamant that the church takes care of widows. There's a reason for that. Because here are women who have lost their provider and their protector. And what he's saying is the church can't see that and pretend it's not there. He says she is out there and the principalities have honed in on her vulnerability. And he says, and if the husband has died early or he crashed in an accident or, or whatever happened and the Lord has, has taken him home to heaven, he said you have to step in and make sure that woman is provided for and protected. And he used the word widows indeed. The women who love God and have gone to church, their husbands have been separated from them. He said, don't just ignore them. He said, because they are women of God. Because God has determined that men not only protect women physically, but they cover them emotionally and spiritually and provide for them materially. Now, I want to move on, but I need an amen before I do. One of the, listen, I tell you, I get mad at the devil for a lot of things, folks. But what he does to women, wives, and mothers is horrendous. And everybody who loves God ought to rise up and say, whatever I can do to right this wrong in the name of Jesus, I'm willing to do. Last year, there was a sad story in the national news. Story of a woman in Tennessee. I'm sure you can probably still find the story. The woman killed her four children and then she killed herself. Now, when they investigate it, it's like what mother would kill four children? And the interesting thing is that sometimes when mothers kill children, they're little babies who annoy them, but these were four teenagers. She killed four teenage children and then turned the gun on herself and killed herself. They said when they did the autopsy on these four dead teenagers, they found out that this woman had fired 34 shots. You know, all it takes is one. 
So this is more than just, you know, an emotional killing. I'm talking about something violent and deranged. 34 shots into these four children. And then she killed herself. And upon investigation, they found out that she was going through a divorce with her husband because the husband, like so many lust-filled, unfaithful men, had started fooling around with some other young girl left his wife and children and he's going to go and do what he wants to and I, I am so convinced today that so many of women's problems are really man problems you all know what I'm saying that woman and her children would still be alive if this was a godly man if he came home every night to his wife instead of his little chicky babe on the side that's why y'all messing around with social media and all this side chick stuff and people just so get into this and so dramatic. All the devil is doing is he's desensitizing us to the wickedness of adultery. And today it's become entertainment. Oh, the side chick. <laughs> Listen, four children and a woman are dead because of an unfaithful man. Ain't nothing funny about that. And it doesn't happen like it happens on social media when there's a little side chick and you're laughing, you know, as she's running down the street. Folks, that is fantasy. Reality is somebody is broken. Children are hurt. Wives are shattered. And in this case, there are five fresh graves because of a lust-filled, unfaithful man. So when I say... Women problems many times are man problems. I don't say that lightly, folks. I say it with all dominion and with all authority. So when we talk about Mother's Day and, and the glory of moms and the beauty of who moms have become, I say that if we as men would take the biblical position that God has given us, we can give blessing, honor, and hope to every woman every wife and every mother in our life. Can I get an amen from you all today? Amen. God is good. Now, let's talk about the text that we read. It's Genesis 29, and I read you the story of a woman whose name is Leah. Now, some of you, if you haven't studied the Bible, you might not know too much about Leah in the Scriptures, but Leah is the sister of a woman named Rachel. And the Bible tells us that this man, Jacob, comes to Laban, the father of these two women, and he says, I want to marry your daughter, Rachel. And he says, you can have Rachel to be your wife. And you all know the story that in the middle of the night after the wedding ceremony, he sneaks Leah into the marriage tent and the Bible says in the morning when Jacob wakes up next to his brand new bride, when the sun comes up and the light hits her face, it is not Rachel in the bed with him, it is Leah. Her father pulled one over on the brother. And we'll talk in a minute about why he did that. But I want you to look at Genesis 29 again. We read these passages, but let me just home in on something that I think will help you. Genesis 29, look at verse number 17 quickly. Here's what the Bible says. It says, Leah's eyes were delicate, but Rachel was beautiful of form and appearance. Now, the Bible is just so cautious here. And instead of saying what needs to be said, that's where you let God so much. God is so good. Here's what God says. He says, Leah had delicate eyes. In the King James Version, if you're reading one of those versions, it'll say, Leah had tender eyes. Now, that doesn't say too much to us. But if you look at the conjunction, it says, Leah, eyes were delicate, and then, but. See, the but tells you everything you need to know. 
But Rachel, Rachel had it going on. The Bible says she was beautiful of form. Y'all know what form means? Rachel was formed beautifully. It said, and not only was her form beautiful, it said, but she had a beautiful appearance. Which means Rachel was shapely and beautiful. But Leah, we have to pray for Leah. Now, the reason this is important is because when you read most Bible commentators, here's what most of them agree about this text, is that uh, Leah was not pretty. Delicate or tender eyes mean that she was cross-eyed. It simply... <laughs> it means that, you know, her facial structure was, was not beautiful like Rachel. And so all we're reading from the Holy Spirit, what God put this in the Bible for so that you can understand the story. And here's what it means. It means uh, Leah was a woman who, according to the scripture, was without a doubt a woman who felt ugly. She's a woman who the Bible says felt unloved. And she felt unwanted. And the reality of this Bible passage is that Jacob was forced to marry her simply so he could get his hands on her sister, Rachel. Now, y'all know that's some drama right there. Married Leah, but the whole time, I want your sister. Now, how would any wife feel when the husband keeps saying, I can't wait till these seven years is over because I'm going to get your sister? What kind of marriage can that be? But the Bible says he's having a sexual relationship with Leah because they have all these children. So not only was she feeling ugly and unwanted and, and rejected, now she's feeling used up. So the Bible doesn't hold back here. He's letting us see that the real dilemma that this woman Leah is in. Now I'm using this today to talk to you because I know that women today feel the same trauma. It's shocking how many women come to church and they feel rejected, they feel unwanted, they feel ugly, and they feel used and abused. Now, we have Jesus inside the church, but think about the women outside the church. Think about those women I described on Cortland Avenue that every time, you know, they dress like that, the guys walk by cat calling them, knowing that all he wants is to get his hands on her body. Now, these women will act like this is what they're interested in, but you don't see them when, according to our article, they go into the doctor's office the following week wanting some antidepressants because they use, they feel so used up and abused and rejected. And there's so many women in the world like that and the way they act and the way they talk and the way they dress and their constant jealousy is proof that there's a whole lot of Leahs in our world today. But you see, we have the Bible today that tells us there's hope for women, wives, and mothers. Come on, can you all say amen? And we're going to talk about that hope. But before we talk about that hope, I want to expose what was going on inside of Leah that caused her to almost self-destruct. Because according to the scripture, she said something. Now go back 
Genesis chapter 29. And let me just read a couple of verses. First of all, I want to read verse number 26. Look at it up here. Genesis 29. Now Laban said, now this is Leah and Rachel's father. Laban said, it must not be done so in our country to give the younger before the firstborn. That's why he snuck Leah into the marriage tent because he said, we cannot give the one you really want. We have to give you this one because she is the first daughter. She is the eldest and we have to give the elder before we can release the younger. Folks, come on. Now that might feel good to him, but think about Leah. Oh, you just using me? You can get seven years of labor from this guy and you're just using me? This just adds to Leah's problem. Come on, you got to see where Leah is so that you can see what was going on inside of her head. Look at verse number 32. Genesis 29, 32. It says, so Leah conceived and bore a son and she called his name Reuben. It says, for she said, now watch, this is in her mind. She said, the Lord has looked upon my affliction, now therefore my husband will love me. Folks, this is crazy thinking. Listen to what's in her head. I have gotten pregnant for this man who doesn't care about me. But maybe this child that will have his name will somehow make him want me. If y'all ladies can't say amen, just go, mm. That's right. Because a whole lot of women have tried that philosophy. I'll have his baby. And this will make him love me. Well, how has that worked out? You know, I, I, I really feel for Leah because I've sat with women exactly like this who are, are so convinced I can't keep him with just who I am. But I'll lock him down with a child. And then he'll love me. Now here's what I want you all to see. Come on, look up here at me. What Leah has done is she's turned marriage and motherhood into idolatry. Listen to it again. Leah has turned marriage and motherhood into idolatry. And idolatry is the one sin that will guarantee that the devil will crush you every time. It is the one sin that led the children of Israel into constant conflict with God and with their neighbors. It's the one sin that kept turning God's face and his favor away from them. And anywhere people will worship idols, it will do the exact same thing. Because God is one. He said, I, the Lord, am one God. He said, have no other gods before me. He said, you shall not make any graven images. God hates idols. Now in this case, the idol is not a piece of stone. The idol is not a piece of wood. The idol is not a statue. Leah has turned marriage and motherhood into idolatry. 
Here's what it means. She's looking to marriage and to motherhood to provide in her life what only God can provide. Look at me, saints. Only God can give you peace. Only God can give you joy. Only God can guarantee your future. But for a moment of time, Leah thinks, this man, he doesn't really want me, but my dad has arranged this marriage. I got him. My sister don't have him. Then we're going to make it work. Ah, that didn't work. I'm going to have some children for him. That'll make him love me. And what she's done is she's elevated marriage and motherhood to a place God has never intended it to be. You ever think you're going to get married to somebody and then they are going to fulfill you 100%. Listen, you're barking up the wrong tree. Why do you think people walk down the aisle, smile, say I do, and have a beautiful reception, and then they're in the divorce court? Why? Because it didn't do what they thought it would do. And it never will. You can never look to marriage as an idol. You want fulfillment, you come to Jesus. You want fulfillment, you get closer to God. Can you say amen? You want joy in your life, you draw yourself closer to Jesus. No man can fulfill you. No woman is going to fulfill you. You are made by God. So in Leah's mind, marriage and motherhood has become something that is going to be unsustainable in its ability to fulfill her and take away the hurt, the anxiety, the rejection, the feeling of low self-esteem. See, that marriage and those children are not going to do it. I'll tell you what marriage and children will do. It will give you more stress. I know some of y'all women don't want to say amen, but you're thinking it. I know you're thinking it. Go ahead, pastor, tell it. Because all you've had since getting married is some headaches and some stress. But look at me. There's hope in Jesus. Because what God wants to show you today is that person you're married to is your partner, and those children are your offspring, but your joy is in Christ. Amen. Say amen, somebody. Amen. Oh, yeah, they're a big part of your life and a big part of your future, but they are not the ones that are going to hold you up and to sustain you. That comes from the Lord Jesus Christ and from him alone. Amen. Come on, say amen. amen. I can just hear poor Leah. She's laying on her bed at night, Nobody's around. I'm so unattractive. I'm unwanted. And she's just sitting there, plotting, scheming. What can I do to bring the hope, the love, the joy, and the acceptance I want? See, so many wives, mothers, and women even though you're not going to admit it here publicly, that's all right. That's why we have an altar. But God sees your hurt. You know, when you go through the supermarket, you get all those magazines designed to get women's attention, and those magazines just keep telling you how unbeautiful you are unless you weigh a certain amount. How pretty you are unless you have this type of makeup. How unfulfilling you are if you haven't gone and gotten your body sculptured at the latest place that's chopping off everybody's flesh. Unless you get your breasts enhanced and your buttocks and pants, unless you get the right hair and the right everything. And the reason those magazines sell is because inside of women's heart, they're looking for the key that's going to make me attractive and acceptable and wanted. 
That's Leah. And the reason there's become such a lack of spirituality among women, even in the church, is because they have made beauty an idol. They have made attention from a man an idol. Mothers have made, you know, beautiful and perfect children. That's going to be my happiness. That's become an idol. And so many people are suffering. This is Leah all over again. See, what you need, folks, uh, is not more things. You need more of God. And God is here for you today. Can somebody say thank you, Jesus? Yeah. So the scripture tells us she had three children. Reuben. Simeon and Levi. And the Bible names them, and each one of their names is significantly connected with this. Now my husband will love me. I even like what it says in verse 34. Put it up here, Genesis 29 and verse number 34. Took a look at what it said. It says, she conceived again and bore a son and said, now this time my husband will become attached to me because I have borne him three sons. And she called his name Levi. First she said, this will make my husband love me. After that didn't work, this will make my husband become attached to me. Can you all see her desperation? Can you see her reaching out? Look at me. Love me. Appreciate me. And child after child after child, she's disappointed. Because all her husband wants is her sister. And nothing she's done, all of those nine months of labor, all of that hard work, none of it has panned out, which would only lead to more depression. More makeup, more depression. More diets, more depression. I'll say amen to myself. I know I'm telling the truth. So in the article, when it asks, what's wrong with women, wives, and mothers? What's going on? Why are they on all these antidepressants? What's going on? Well, see, this scripture is helping us to see into the secret life of so many precious mothers, precious women, and precious wives. They live in the secret world of unhappiness. Am I pretty enough? Am I good enough? Am I this enough? Am I smart enough? Am I this? Am I that? And they're constantly berating themselves, trying this product, trying that, trying everything they can. And when nothing works, in our generation, you can just go get on some Xanax. You can just go get you some Prozac. But see, there was no Prozac in Leah's day. There was no therapist in Leah's day. There were no counselors in Leah's day. And here's what it boils down to before I get ready to finish my message. Please don't turn me off right here, folks. This is so important. See, Leah didn't just want children. The problem is that she needed children. There's a big difference. You know when a man and a woman get married and they say, hey, we, we want a child, that's a beautiful thing. But see, for her, she didn't want children. She needed them to fulfill an emptiness in her life. And that's where the idolatry comes from. See, if you're a young lady in here, and in your mind, I need a man, you already in trouble. Because you haven't found fulfillment in Jesus, and you can't be no kind of wife to a man when you need a man that much. See, what you need is Christ. What you need is the mercy and the security that is found in Jesus. That's what makes you a good mother. That's what makes you a good wife. Can y'all help me by saying amen today? She made marriage and motherhood something God had never intended it to be. And it completely left her empty and broken. See, I preach the gospel and every Christian church preaches the gospel. 
Because when you get saved, woo, woo, when you come to Christ, when you come out of the world and give your life to Jesus, there are two beautiful things that happen when you become a Christian. Number one, God forgives you. Hallelujah. See, Christianity is not you joining a church. Christianity is not you getting some church clothes and getting a big family Bible and showing up here. That is not what Christianity is. That's why I get so upset with, with southern people in the Bible belt because so many people sit in church, but they're not born again. When you come to Jesus, God forgives you. And when God forgives you, guess what that means? It means, number one, there is no condemnation anymore. Amen. You know that you've sinned. I know that you've sinned. God and the devil both know that you've sinned. But because of the blood of Jesus, you have been forgiven. And you come to Christ and he washes the slate clean. And what that means is nobody can throw your sins or your past in your face ever again. Why? There is no more condemnation. What? That means you can walk with your head high. You can walk with your chest out. I'm saved. I'm forgiven. I don't care what I've done in the past. God has cleansed it. Listen, that will take away the anxiety. Salvation gives you forgiveness. But I'll tell you what else it does. It takes away the guilt. When you know you've done things to violate and to hurt people, and people walk around with this guilt of, you know, I've ruined my family. I did this. I made these mistakes when I was a teenager. And you feel so guilty. See, God takes away the condemnation, but God takes away the guilt. Yes. Folks, that is liberating. Yes. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Oh, we can come to church and we can raise our hands. Come on. We can sing, I'm free, I'm free, even though the devil is whispering in your ear. You know what you've done. You say, I don't care. I know what Jesus did. Can you say amen? The past is gone. It's liberating. Why? Because you've been forgiven. So salvation brings forgiveness. But here is the other thing salvation gives you. It gives you acceptance. Amen. See, because Jesus takes you with all of your mess. <laughs> See, this is not a kind of religion where you've got to fix up yourself before you come. See, when it comes to Jesus, he says, come just the way you are. Can you say amen? Amen. And for him to say that, you know that you've got a bag of weed in your pocket. You know that you've got horrible things in your mind. You know you've been cheating people at work. You've been stealing money off of the top. You know that you've been lying. And he still says, come. What that means is that he accepts you. And here's what acceptance means. Never again do you have to perform to please somebody. I ain't got to put on no makeup to make you love me. I am accepted by God. Say amen. I don't have to have a certain position at, at the work. I don't have to have a certain amount of money. I don't have to look a certain way to be accepted. I am accepted by God. Can you say amen? You can crawl out from under that rock where you always got to walk the right way and say the right thing. You've always got to be the right person or they won't love me. He said, accept it. Salvation gives you forgiveness, no guilt, no condemnation. It gives you acceptance, no more performance. Here's what it means. All you need is Jesus. Did you hear me? I said, all you need is Jesus. So poor Leah, year after year, just like I'm reading in this article, women, wives, and mothers beating themselves down. Yet in the Bible, Jesus says this, come unto me. 
Hallelujah. Now let me give a little stick in here. I know y'all getting excited when I talk about forgiveness and acceptance. Y'all ain't going to like this part. Because I'll tell you where social media is hurting people. You know where it's hurting people? Because people are relying on social media to do what only God can do. And if social media was in Leah's day, she would be posting just like women do today. Here is me standing in front of the park. And you know, the butt always has to be out. <laughs> Selfie, here's me. Here's me in a bikini. Here's me in some tight jeans. I told you, if you can't say amen, just go, mm, and we, we, that's all it takes. Now, you tell me what that is. Come on, just be honest. I'll tell you exactly what it is. I am, a, I am addicted. <laughs> oh! I am addicted to the comments, and I am addicted to the likes. I am addicted to the views. Why? Because the more of those I get, the better I feel about myself. And you have made social media an idol. And instead of finding your peace in Jesus and finding your hope in your relationship with God, you're out there fishing for strange men to click and to like. And I'll tell you right now, if you're a husband or you're engaged to a woman and, and she's addicted to that, you ought to rise up and say, stop that mess right now in Jesus' name. And it's become a cause of great contention among a lot of people. There was a woman the other day that a clip was sent to me. Somebody emailed it to me about that show Dr. Phil. Y'all know who Dr. Phil is. And there was a woman that was on his show broken and weeping because she said she will not go out of the house without makeup on. And her mother and her sisters are trying to tell her, you know, she runs out of makeup, she'll sit in the house for two or three days. You know, if she doesn't have any money, she's not going out of the house. If she loses a job, she doesn't care. But I'm not stepping out into the front yard without some makeup on. Here is Leah right here in modern day. Woman who feels so unfulfilled about herself that she's got to paint herself up. If people see who I really am, they won't like me. Makeup has become an idol. Now, let me leave that alone and give you all some good news. Right? Somebody say, thank you, Pastor. <laughs> hey, but you can't leave it alone until you make the case. Because when you get the good news, it's, it's even better. Because our scripture tells us that Leah did not go out like this. And that's the beauty of the passage that I read. We see her desperation, but we also see her redemption. And the same thing that redeemed her will redeem us in here today. Now I want you to look at the final verse, which is verse 35 in Genesis 29. Because in verse number 35, after she's had three children, Levi, Simeon, and Reuben, the Bible says she has a fourth child. And it said, and she conceived again and bore a son and said, read it with me, everybody. Now I will praise the Lord. <clears throat> when she had her fourth child, she didn't say, hope he'll love me. Hope he'll be attached to me. Hope he'll notice me. When she had her fourth child, she said, you know what? I'm done trying to please that crazy man. I'm done trying to get him to like me and to pay attention to me. And what did she do? She says, now I will praise the Lord. Now notice, therefore she called his name what? 
Judah, which means praise. And then notice what the Bible says at the end. Then she stopped bearing. I ain't doing this no more. He started coming in the bedroom at night. <laughs> she said, uh-uh. <laughs> I ain't doing this no more. You want my sister? Go get her. But you ain't driving me crazy. Sitting up in here taking pills every day, worried about you. Where you at? Oh, every I'm on my knee praying, oh, God, make it love me. Oh, God, I'm sitting here driving myself crazy, and you don't care nothing about me. She said, I ain't doing this no more. And it says she spoke out and said, now I will praise the Lord. I've been praising that man. I've been praising the good looks of my sister on the magazines. She said, uh-uh, now I'm going to praise the Lord. In other words, I'm going right back to what my mom and daddy them taught me. I'm going right back to what I learned in Sunday school. I should have stayed there all along and I would have been all right. I'm going to go right back to God. Can you say amen? I'm going right back to the Bible. I'm getting right back in church. Come on, instead of going to the club, Get yourself in church. Come on, say amen. Instead of trying to find it on the internet, get yourself in church. She said, now I will praise the Lord. And she called that boy Judah. And every time she picked up that little baby, she said it, praise, praise, praise. And she reminded herself to look to God, to praise God, to worship the Lord, to lift him up. Don't look to a man. Look to God. What is the hope? For women, wives, and mothers is to come back to Jesus. You ain't got to go shopping for the latest fashion. Come back to Jesus. You want hope, blessing, and fulfillment? Listen to Leah. She said, I'm not finishing my days like this. I've been so tormented, but I'm done. And she said, now I'm going to praise the Lord. And the Bible says she stopped having children to try to please this man. And her latter days, this is so beautiful. If you read in the book of Genesis, and I didn't pull up the scripture. I was rushing this morning. But you, I, I, I'll give it to you if you want it. That, you know, when, when she died, it says she, they buried her with All Jacob wanted was Rachel. Rachel was buried in a complete separate tomb. Matter of fact, if you go on the road, I've been there. From Jerusalem down to Bethlehem along that road, there's a beautiful tomb where Rachel is buried. It's called Rachel's Tomb. You can go there and see it today. It's on the Christian tour. When we stop, you can go in and take a look at it. She's buried in a beautiful sepulcher all along the road there by herself. But Leah got buried with Jacob. And what that means is her latter end was more joyful than when she tried to do it herself because she said, now I'm going to praise the Lord. I want everybody here to say praise the Lord. If you're a mother, you better learn to say praise the Lord. If you're a young teenage girl, you got to learn to say praise the Lord. You hear me? If you're a married woman, you learn to say praise the Lord because you're going to wake up one day and look at that rascal and you're going to say, what in the world have I done? Amen. And you better be able to say praise the Lord because it is God who is the sustainer. It is God is the one who gives hope. Can everybody say amen? You know, when Jesus hung on the cross, you know, the Bible tells us the story. I think we read it on Easter Sunday. It says the people that were there when Jesus died were the women. Y'all know how crazy Peter was. He backslid and ran away. The rest of them were so scared of the Jews and persecuted. But you know who were there all, while he was on the cross, right at the foot of the cross, weeping? It says the women. And who was there on resurrection morning? It was Mary, it was Martha, it was, it was Salome, it was Mary, the mother of Jesus, Mary Magdalene. All of the women were there. 
And it's interesting because the women were so much more abused in those days when women had no rights, but yet they found hope in Jesus, didn't they? And they clung to him who was a real man who accepted them the way they were. And even when the disciples, the great men of God, when they ran in fear, it was the women who stayed there and in the end were the first ones to give testimony that Jesus has risen from the dead. And I'll tell you why. Because Jesus is a woman's greatest hope. If you're not saved, give your life to Jesus. If you've been backslidden from the Lord, come back to Jesus. If you're in church, stay in church. And learn what Jesus can do because he is the hope for all women, for all wives, and for all mothers. And I pray that how Leah finished her life would be a testimony to every woman here on this month that I'm going to finish my days saying I will praise the Lord. Not I'm going to wear another mini dress. Not that I got to get the latest hairstyle. But I'm going to praise the Lord. And you'll go to your grave with great joy because you've clung on to Jesus. He is the only one. The Bible calls him the author and the finisher of our faith. Amen, everybody? How many of you got the message? You understand what I'm saying today? Amen. Praise the Lord. Let's pray. Come on, let's pray together. Bow your head. Father, we thank you for the message today. We thank you for the word of the Lord. And I pray that as we leave the service today, we will carry the message. Now I will praise the Lord. Please keep your head bowed, everybody, and keep your eyes closed for just a moment before we dismiss. You know, our message today is pretty clear. That God loves the world, that God loves you. Our message is very simple. That he is the only hope that Christian faith and a relationship with Jesus is where your hope is, it's where your joy is, it's where your blessing is, it's where your future is. You're here today and you say, well, you know, Pastor, I'm so far from God. That's okay. Because you're here today in the house of the Lord. And one thing that you can't deny is that the gospel tells how much he loves you. And regardless of who you are or where you've been, regardless of your failures and what you've done, nothing, the Bible says, can separate you from the love of Jesus. But today you need to come to him. You need to receive him as your personal savior. You need to confess your own faith in him. The pastor can't get saved for you. Your mother can't get saved for you. Your husband or your wife can't. You have to give your own life to Jesus. And if you're a man and you're in here today or if you're a woman and you know that you're not right with God, then it's going to be a sad life for you, a life of searching, a life of constantly looking, trying to find that thing that can fulfill all of the emptiness of your soul, but it's nowhere to be found. The devil and the world will promise everything money will be spent miles will be traveled trying to find what the world can never give you this is Leah's story she tried it all and in the end what did she do she had to come back to Jesus see you're here today and you can say pastor I want to come back to the Lord I want to rededicate myself to Christ today I want to come and trust him by faith and receive him Open your heart to him today as we get ready to dismiss the service. Who in here today needs God? Who in here would say, Pastor, I, I hear what you're saying. And I understand the message of the gospel is that God so loved the world, me included, that he gave Jesus to die on the cross. And I realize that without Jesus, I am nothing. Without that salvation, I don't have a hope and a prayer. I'll search all throughout this world, but the searching can end just like it did for Leah by you just coming and saying, you know, Pastor, I want to pray. Would you pray with me? And I will pray with you. If you will just simply open your heart and say, Jesus, I need you tonight. Come on, I want to say a prayer for you. If you're here today, just keep your head bowed. Keep your eyes closed. Come on, don't look around for a moment. This is the moment where God is dealing with somebody and you say, Pastor, 
I never knew that I would meet God today like this. I didn't understand that your word today would minister so clearly to me. But I don't want to keep searching. And I sure don't want to make a fool of myself. I don't want men or women to use me anymore. I want God to save me. And I want to go to heaven one day with him. And the only way that's possible is by coming to Jesus Christ and receiving him as Lord of your life. There's somebody here you need God today. And you say, Pastor, I want to give my life to Christ today. I want to turn from the world. I'm ready to repent. I want God to forgive me of my sins. If you want that, can I say a prayer for you? Slip your hand up and just wave it at me so I can say a prayer for you. Right there in your seat. I see one hand in the back. Anybody else? Quickly, I see another one in back there. Anybody else? Come on. I see another one over here. Anybody else? Come on. Just join these. Just raise your hand. There's nothing difficult about the gospel message. Say, I need the Lord, Pastor. I need a new life. I can't live the way I'm living anymore. God has laid it all out, and I want to make peace with God. I want to get right with God. Anybody else want to join these? Maybe you're here, and you've backslidden from the Lord. You used to go to church at one time. And you used to really love God, but I know the temptation. Remember Leah? You're tempted. I'm hurting. Nobody sees me. Nobody loves me. And you go out there and you do all kind of things and sin just to get some self-esteem and some attention. But it's broke you. It's crushed you. And you say, I got to stop it, Pastor, like Leah. And I got to come to Christ. Come on, if you're here and you've backslidden from the Lord and you want to come back, can I say a prayer for you? Come on, raise your hand if that's you. Say, Pastor, I grew up in church. I knew what it was like to be a Christian. I knew what it was like. My mama and grandmama and my auntie and my uncles used to carry me to church, and I felt the love of God, but I got big and turned away, but I want to come back. Thank you today for the message. I receive it. Anybody else? Quickly, just raise your hand. Say, Pastor, that's me. Come on, don't fight the Holy Spirit. Don't fight him. Yield to him. Don't fight when God is dealing with you. No. It's a long, hard road to try to make somebody love you. But it's a harder road when you give yourself to them and then they betray you. So you want to know what's wrong with women, wives, and children according to that article I read? They open up a door at a young age and then they can't close it. And they're broken and crushed by this wicked world. Oh, Jesus loves you, and he wants to show you that love today. Anybody else want to come and pray? All right, here's what I want you to do. If you raised your hand, look up here at me. Look up if you raised your hand. My brother's here. Man back there, my brother. I want you to come here. Let me pray for you. Stand up. I want you to come here. Come here. Let me say a prayer for you. Come on. Come on. Come on. Come on. Come on. You raise your hand. Just come here. I want a couple of altar workers. Come on, my brother. Come on. Let me just say a prayer for you right here. Hallelujah. In the name of Jesus. Come on, young lady. Come on and kneel down right here. Come on, my brother. We thank you, Jesus. Oh, come on, young lady. God, she's going to say a prayer for you. Come on, just kneel down right there. Father, in Jesus' name, come on, kneel down right here. This is it. Come on, surrender. Hallelujah. Father, I thank you, Lord. Come on, just receive him today. Just receive his love. Come on, just bring him. Let, let Jesus come in today. Let's all stand to our feet, everybody. Come on, I want to pray for you. If you're a woman, a wife, and a mother, teenage girl in just a moment I'm going to ask you to come for prayer but the altar is open if you want to come you say pastor I'm that woman you're talking about today I've been searching I'm like Leah I've been making an idol out of things come on down on the altar and just say God forgive me come on say you know what I'm accepted by God I am forgiven by God I don't need to perform. I don't need to prove anything to anybody. Come on and let the Lord love you. Say, God, I know who I am. You've saved me. You've forgiven me. I don't have to show anybody anything. I don't have to lean on somebody to make me feel like somebody. Come on. I need God. Yeah. Come on. Come on, what did Leah said? She said, now I'm going to praise the Lord. That's what God wants to hear from you. Just tell him, say, Lord, I'm praising you. I'm looking to you. I'm not looking to the world anymore. I'm not looking to things anymore. Come on, in the name of Jesus. Come on, while these are praying, we're going to sing this song. You love me. Come on. When I was so unlovely, you thought of me. 
when I was lost. Come on, everybody. You showed me how much you really love me. When you bought at the highest cost, at the highest. There's no greater love. Come on. And there's no greater love than this. There's no greater love than this. 